Thank you very much. So this is a very exciting time to be on the commission as we begin talking about the our role in implementing the county strategic plan. Um, as noted in the county plan, the success of the strategy will require state, county, and city governments, people living with HIV, community-based organizations, and local health care agencies to work together to really maximize efforts and better coordinate uh, responses for prevention and care. So. Now, more than ever, all levels of government must work together um, to invest in achieving the goals of the strategy by taking action and partnering with stakeholders. Um, I'm pleased to bring the city's, uh, the city's uh, HIV Zero uh, plan to the commission because the city's goals are complementary and will aid in the county strategies to reduce annual infections, increase diagnoses, and increase viral suppression. Um, so, how do we move forward? Oh, there we go. It's a big arrow? Okay. So West Hollywood is a tiny municipality of about 37,000 people in the Hollywood Wilshire district. Um, and HIV had a significant impact on the city due to a high infection rate and a devastatingly high number of deaths. Um, in response to this, West Hollywood was one of the first government entities to provide social service grants to local HIV organizations. And in 1985, the City Council established the Social Services Division to provide services to community members in need. And the first grant was given to the then um, Gay and Lesbian Center for Prevention and Care. And throughout the city's history, its leadership, the city council has directed tens of millions of dollars to fund direct services, uh, education, and awareness campaigns. And today, the city budgets approximately 4.5 million um, per year in funding to programs that impact thousands of community members that uh, who live, work, go to school, or who are homeless the majority of time in West Hollywood. And after decades of direct action, political organizing, strategic prevention, and programmatic efforts, we now have the biomedical interventions to stop new infections and help reduce viral loads to undetectable. So in 2015, council members D'Amico and Duran, both of whom are elected officials living with HIV, initiated a council item to develop a strategic plan aimed at reducing the rates of infection to zero and slowing disease progression. The council approved this, this initiative and directed staff to work with social service providers, local doctors, boards and commissions, and other government agencies. The development of the plan took a little more than a year. Um, staff and consultants received direction from our HIV Substance Abuse Treatment Providers Collaborative. Um, which is made up of social service providers, testing and treatment agencies, mental health professionals, substance abuse providers, and DHSP staff. Um, the strategic plan was initiated by council, but providers uh, really played a crucial role in uh, drafting the plan. The city held regular planning meetings, and providers informed the process every step of the way. And so after numerous meetings, the city brought drafts to stakeholder groups for input, such as the city's Human Services Commission, the Transgender Advisory Board, the Senior Advisory Board, the Disabilities Advisory Board, and the Lesbian and Gay Advisory Board. And the council approved the strategic plan in February of 2017. So the Social Services Division um, leads the coordination and the oversight of the goals and our priorities, uh, as well as our priorities, but priorities, but our HIV Zero partners, our contracted agencies really um, play a crucial role in the implementation. And as part of our RFP process in 2016, we encouraged agencies to address the HIV Zero initiative in their grant proposals. And the agencies that were funded um, those um, activities were incorporated into the contract and the scope of services. Um, the implementation or the evaluation is structured over a two-year period, and our consultant Aaron is currently working on year one of the evaluation. So just to talk about West Hollywood's role in the epidemic for a second, um, West Hollywood triples in population size every weekend, and it's a global destination for nightlife, welcoming thousands of people every weekend and many more during Pride season. 
Um, and for this reason, the city is mindful of its role in addressing the epidemic um, in Los Angeles County, as well as in the Southern California LGBT community. The city funds campaigns that have appeared in various street media, local magazines, and social media, uh, such as our last campaign, Text Prep, um, in 2015. Uh, we also fund We Ho Life, a website operated by the LGBT Center that provides sexual health and prevention messaging um, through social media. And we've also partnered with um, local YouTube stars and Instagram stars to film PSAs, such as the Hukuna Travada video, which was released uh, a little over a year ago. The city's response to the epidemic has been recognized as a model for other cities nationally and globally. We recognize that many people come to West Hollywood for treatment and other services, and we're proud that the funding that we provide to West Hollywood community members increases the capacity of agencies to uh, serve more County of Los Angeles uh, constituents. So I'm going to pass this over to Aaron, who's going to talk about the plan in detail. Um, so thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. This is the first time I've addressed uh, the commission. Uh, I'd like to, oh, I think, this will be interesting. Um, I'd like to say, really, just to begin, that the, my work on the HIV Zero Initiative uh, did not come in a vacuum, uh, and it was heavily informed by previous work with the City of Los Angeles AIDS Coordinator's Office. Uh, I see Ricky and, and Dahlia here. Uh, prior to coming on to help develop the, refine the goals, strategies, and indicators of progress for the uh, City of West Hollywood HIV Zero Initiative, uh, I worked with Ricky and Dahlia, the AIDS Coordinator's Office, to help update their HIV treatment and prevention strategy, or the white paper. And so that, that paper was really an early version of the city's uh, getting to zero plan. And so that, the learning, the lessons learned from that process really helped inform uh, my involvement in this process as well. So I just want to state that. It, nothing comes from a vacuum. And even the process of developing that and this came from looking at other municipalities, uh, the national strategy on HIV and AIDS. Uh, and so I'm going to talk a little bit in this uh, section about uh, the characteristics of HIV in the city of West Hollywood, discuss how the HIV Zero Initiative sort of contributes to the county strategy for 2020 and beyond. I'm going to outline the HIV Zero strategies, target communities, and indicators of progress. And I'm going to share the results of the first wave of the survey on stigma that we're doing as a, a metric to measure how we're, how we're addressing stigma in West Hollywood. And then we're going to open it up to discussions. OK. Oh, that's backwards. We'll get this. OK. So first, we looked at HIV surveillance data to determine basically the characteristics of the epidemic in West Hollywood. Who's living with HIV, what groups are driving new infections, and diagnoses. And then we looked at, I said, the national, national HIV AIDS strategy to understand how it can contribute to the, to the broader goals nationally. Then we reviewed social services contracts to see what type of services would be meeting the needs of the community and the goals that we had set. Then we used all of this to prioritize the target communities and develop the metrics or the indicators of progress. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the health district. Uh, as most of you probably know that the county moved away from the service planning area model to health district model. And West Hollywood is located in the Hollywood Wilshire Health District, which is the health district with the highest rate of HIV in the county. And the city of West Hollywood has the highest rate of HIV in, this health, in the health district and the county. 21% uh, of people living with HIV in the Hollywood Wilshire Health District live in the city of West Hollywood. 
And this is, you can see sort of the boundaries of it, and probably know West Hollywood is to the left of La Brea. <laughs> Everyone knows this. Okay. We're going to talk about transmission modes. Uh, in the city, 98% of people living with HIV uh, are gay and bisexual men. That includes 93% MSM and 5% MSM uh, IDU. And just a little under 2% uh, acquired HIV or living with HIV as a result of heterosexual contact or intravenous drug use or injection drug use. So as a result of that, because it's so uh, concentrated among men, gay and bisexual men in the city, most of the data that we were able to acquire from the county is male specific just based on the need to uh, protect people's identity. And so much of the data that I'll be presenting is going to be specific to men. And that's, that's the caveat. That's why that's the case. Um, so what we see here is that this is based to every 100 men. And what we see is about 13%, 12.5% of all men in the city of West Hollywood are living with HIV, compared to just under 1% or 0 0.085 in the county of Los Angeles. And the next down, you see that about just, less to, just under a third of all men in West Hollywood are acquiring HIV each year, compared to 0 0.03 in the county of Los Angeles. And this, these numbers are as of 2016. The race and ethnicity of people living with HIV, 69% are white, 20% Latino, 5% black, and then 6% are identified as other races, which, again, we couldn't split out for confidentiality issues. <coughs> Nor could we receive the data. Um, these are the ages of people living with HIV. It tends to skew older. Um, as you can see, the largest cohort of people living with HIV are 45 to 54-year-olds. And about 64% of all people are over 45 who are living with HIV in the city of West Hollywood. Sorry, sorry neglecting this side. I'm giving you my back. Um, which runs con is in direct contrast to people who are acquiring the new, new infections, as we've seen in the county as well, are primarily among younger, uh, younger men, 64%, so it's almost the inverse. And now I'm going to talk about how the city's goals contribute to the county's goals of 2020 and beyond. So the county has three broad goals. They are to reduce annual HIV infections, to increase the proportion of people living with HIV who are diagnosed, and then, of course, to increase the proportion of people who are diagnosed with HIV to make sure that they're virally suppressed. And so the city, although the goals aren't parallel, this was developed uh, at least a year before the county uh, disseminated their goals, all of, the count, all of the city's goals contribute to the county's broad goals as well. So the first goal for the city is to expand access to health care for people living with HIV and persons who are currently at an elevated risk. And so the, the thinking behind that is to expand upon uh, a broader HIV care continuum, which includes uh, high-risk HIV-negative gay and bisexual men and others in the community who are at an elevated risk. And the thinking is that by linking people to care, those living with HIV and those at an elevated risk, uh, we can make sure that people are, are getting on art or antiretroviral therapy or treatments and also getting a PrEP consultation. So that's number one. The second one is to reduce HIV infections, same as the county. The third is to reduce HIV-related health disparities or disparities in health inequalities. And this is to make sure that all people who are in the city, uh, regardless of their HIV status, have access to culturally competent health care and health care providers. And this, is, this also contributes to an indicator, which is uh, to reduce stigma overall. And the fourth goal for the city is to slow the disease progression from HIV to stage 3, or AIDS. 
I'm going to talk about the strategies. We have nine strategies. The first is to increase healthcare enrollment, uh, especially among young, young men. Uh, currently, young men are the least likely to have health insurance uh, falling below the average. It's not tremendously below, but it's, uh, it's about 4% gap between uh, young men and the average, uh, the average person living in West Hollywood. The second is to uh, use prevention and outreach strategies and education. The third is to implement biomedical interventions, of course have substance abuse treatment programs, mental health care, testing and linkage, retention and care for people living with HIV, building inclusive communities, regardless of someone's HIV status, and increasing public health awareness around HIV. Next portion is we're going to talk about the program targets. So, the city has two broad targets, the HIV negative community members at a heightened risk for HIV and HIV uh, positive members, or people living with HIV in the city. And so among HIV negative uh, members, they include gay and bisexual men, especially younger men uh, who are sexually active and those with a history of sexually transmitted infections, women, including transgender women, especially those who are sexually active, low income, or sexually tra have transmi sexually transmitted infections or engage in sex work. And then those who are using meth or IDUs or inject uh, injection drugs. And then for HIV positive community members, it's to make sure that we're targeting the newly diagnosed, those living with HIV but not linked to care, and those who have a de detectable viral load. And finally, I'm gonna talk about the indicators of progress. We have seven indicators of progress. These are the metrics by which we are going to uh, determine how, how we're doing. And so the first is healthcare coverage. I mentioned before that the primary goal for this is to target younger men to make sure that they are getting up to par in terms of having healthcare coverage. Um, and it also includes making sure that everyone has healthcare coverage or as many people as possible in the city. The second is to reduce HIV diagnoses. Uh, the, and, and let me say this, I'm not, I'm not going into the actual numbers. Those are available in the report, which uh, we're having messengered over and, and should be available by the end of the meeting if anyone's interested. Plus, it will be, it's available online. Linkage to care. Of course, retention and care. Oh, there's such a delay on this thing. Viral suppression. Stage three diagnoses. I don't even think it's working anymore. This is just me pushing a button. Um, anyway, the fifth is suppression, viral suppression, stage three diagnoses, and then reducing stigma. And at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Derek so that he can discuss some of the social services contracts that the city has in place to help achieve some of the goals and indicators of progress. So, so I'm back again. So uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about our um, social service provider. So providers play a pivotal role in, measure, in measuring the indicators of progress that Aaron just talked about. Um, funding decisions are data-driven, and we aim to leverage all of our contracts to make the biggest impact. So findings from this evaluation will help us gain an understanding of the gaps in services and uh, where we should allocate future funding. The city's relationship with contracted providers is unique because um, we work daily with providers, and our interactions emphasize a cooperative approach. and. Participa participatory approach to addressing um, our community members' needs. Um, HIV touches all of the issues listed on this slide, so we pull in providers who don't normally work together to remove barriers and remove silos and encourage teamwork and service delivery and um, with the city and with our agency partners. We hold regular planning coordination meetings um, on HIV prevention, substance, substance abuse, transgender services, homeless services, mental health, health, and food and nutrition. 
We encourage collaborations and we work together to find solutions um, to many of these challenges that community members face. The HIV Substance Abuse Prevention Providers Collaborative has been meeting for more than 20 years. Um, as I mentioned before, they are very instrumental in this plan and in informing us of um, community members' needs. Um, from the very beginning, the providers pushed us to address stigma uh, in the plan and to find a way, no matter how difficult, to measure stigma. So um, we'll continue to look uh, to providers for our policies and protocols moving forward. And um, with that said, I'm going to give this back to Erin, who is going to talk about the survey on stigma that um, we've done. It was uh, done about a year ago, and here are the preliminary results of that survey. Thank you. All right, so we're doing a tag team here. Uh, so, can uh, thank you. So, when we talk about stigma, we're, we're taking we're taking direction from the National HIV/AIDS Strategy, which at this point uh, it's unclear if it even exists anymore. But that is. Uh, that's what informed our thinking here. And what, the, what that strategy said was that we should, prom we should uh, promote evidence-based public health approaches to HIV prevention and care, and we should dismantle discrimination in clinical settings. And so when we, when we talk about stigma, it's such a difficult thing to, to measure. We're looking at it from two, with two basic, basic metrics. Uh, the first is our capacity to reduce HIV among the highest risk group in the city of West Hollywood, which is young, gay, and bisexual men. That's the first metric. And the second is our capacity to actually uh, reduce the experience that people living with HIV have of discrimination in clinical settings, as well as the experiences of discrimination that people who are at an elevated risk for HIV may face in clinical settings and discrimination in daily life. So. This is uh, the survey on stigma. We, uh, as Derek mentioned, it was conducted last year in September, and it was a combination of outreach pop-ups where people would intercept uh, community members at different events, as well as it was conducted online by a service provider, WeHo Life, on their site. So th those are the two methods that we use to collect these surveys. and. So this is giving uh, the gender identity of participants. We conducted 286 surveys, 77% identified as male, 21% as female, 2% trans female, and just a little under half of a percent identified as either non-binary or trans male. Uh, the sexual identity is as follows, 62.3% uh, identified as gay, 24% as uh, straight, about 5.6% bisexual, 3%, 3.5% lesbian, 2.8% sexually fluid, and then 1.4% as other. And, and uh, overall, 63% identified as a gay or bisexual males. So this, uh, this slide shows among the the participants who were HIV positive or HIV negative, how comfortable they are speaking to their provider about their sexual health. And 90% of HIV positive uh, participants felt comfortable versus 83% of the HIV negative participants. And uh, let me say, these numbers are for uh, the participants identified as gay and bisexual men. On the right side, we see that 4% of the HIV positive often feel uncomfortable speaking about sex with doctors, so that's really low, uh, versus 9% among gay and bisexual HIV negative men. It was 9%. So this is uh, a table that shows experiences of discrimination in daily life. On the left side, it includes HIV positive gay and bisexual men, and on the right, HIV negative gay and bisexual men. And what we see is that men living with HIV, gay and bisexual men living with HIV in the city, 35% still experience discrimination based on their HIV status. 
A little bit down below, you see the next, uh, or I'm sorry, just above that, 28% uh, feel discriminated against based on their sexual identity. And uh, the third major category for uh, the, the positive community is age discrimination. Um, whereas uh, among HIV negative men, sexual identity plays the largest role in, in, the, in terms of their sense of discrimination. Um, but more in that cohort don't experience discrimination at all. And the question that we asked was a five-point Likert, Likert scale, and it was usually or always. And so this is reporting the people that say usually or always I feel discriminated against based on my sexual identity or my status or race, ethnicity, and so on. I'll go on to the next one. And so this one, uh, this slide is showing among the, tar the, the core target for prevention, young HIV negative gay and bisexual men, which the sample size is very small, it's 24, uh, 17 to 34 year olds, their understanding of PrEP, their awareness, risk assessment. And so, very positive, 96% uh, are aware of PrEP, which is good. Uh, just a little over half have had a, a provider discuss using PrEP. We'd like to see that number go up. Um, just over a third are never concerned about HIV infection. Half have used PrEP in the last six months. And when we asked, well, why are you not using PrEP? Just, this is a quarter of them say they're concerned about the side effects being harmful, or they don't know where to buy it, or how to pay for it. Now, we know the discussion is supposed to be about lessons learned and challenges. It's, it's pretty early to describe or have much to say about that, but what we can say is that, you can bring up the third one as well, thank you. Oh, we, we've, had, <laughs> we've had three, three major things have come. One, we shifted from an aggregate approach for working with service providers, where in the past, service providers have sent in reports to the city saying, we have we've given service to 2,500 men aged, you know, 35 to 45. Uh, we've treated so many women in this age category. And moving away from that model, we moved to a, a model where we're asking for more client-specific data so that we can understand how different groups are receiving services. And so that was one of the major challenges, communi communicating that shift and working with providers to, to, make, it, to make that transition work. Um, the second major barrier for us, at least at this level, is the schedule that DHSP has for disseminating uh, HIV surveillance data. Um, we've been told that they're going to speed that up. Uh, we haven't seen that yet, but we're, we're still hopeful. So <laughs> that's... Uh, that's another challenge. And then, of course, communicating the results to stakeholders. Uh, the city is really committed to making sure that this is an iterative process where the community is very engaged and is able to give feedback constantly. So, uh, constantly sounds a little harsh, but to, to, give, to give updates and be involved in the process to the extent possible. And so, we, we, take, the, we take the report and the results of the evaluation to different stakeholder community groups um, multiple times every quarter to make sure that we get that. And so making sure that we're able to communicate the results in a accessible way is, is something that we're learning to do better as well. And so at this point, those are, the, those are the major challenges and we're open to questions and discussion about this for the time remaining. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron and Derek.